right. But before that, Eddie, please. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> I was born in 1982 on the day Thatcher declared war on the Falklands Islands. The paramedics in London were on strike on that day. And I was brought to hospital in a green goddess by the army because the paramedics were on strike and I've never forgiven my mother uh, for that insult. But that is the truth. I was, born, I was born in South London to an Irish family. My dad was a seafarer out of the Port of London, which is now gone. Um, I grew up on a council estate. We never saw a Labour politician. We barely saw decent work, any of us. Most of us turned to petty crime. Most of us turned to selling drugs or whatever we could do, fiddling a doll try and get enough money together to look after our families. I ain't ashamed of it. It's, a, it's something that a lot of us have had to do. Uh, but fundamentally, the institutions of the labour movement that should have been available to me weren't there. It weren't until I joined the railway in 2007, 2008, just after my son was born, and I, I got my RMT membership card that things changed. Because for the first time, I had dignity. Before that, I'd worked on building sites. I'd worked in slaughterhouses. I'd worked in sales. I'd knocked on doors. Uh, I'd worked up on scaffolding without harnesses, without health and safety. I'd done whatever I could to get a few quid together, but for the first time with my union card, I had dignity, I had democracy in my workplace, I had fellowship. I was no longer just a wage slave, taking what I could, but somebody who had the ability through my own movement to make my voice heard on the, on the matters that were fundamental to me and my class. And my trade union um, has always been opposed to the European Union, right from the inception of it from every iteration of it, right back to the EEC, there was a resolution from our Glasgow number no. 5 branch that said, our aims as a trade union cannot be met without a sovereign government with which to enact those policies. And that was back in the 50s. Now, my story is not that different to most working class people in this country. Previously, where we had industry, where people had dignity and jobs, neoliberalism, the last four decades, have robbed us, first of all, of those industries at our work, and second of all, of our institutions. You go to labour clubs around the country, now you see UKIP posters. You go to working class areas where people had work, now you see destitution. And it's those same people that have been robbed of work and then robbed of a voice in their own movement who are, who are looked upon, really, by much of the left in this country as being stupid, as being ignorant, as being bigots, as being racists. We had a march in London not too long ago of a load of football hooligans. And I saw so many people on the left saying this is the 1930s all over again. This is the 1930s, they were saying. 1,500 or 15,000 people from northern towns with, uh, with regional accents, and suddenly it's the 1930s all over again. But now, look, we've had a couple of hundred thousand people marching in London against democracy, but no one can see the threat there. <laughs> so it makes me wonder. Now, when... I have never seen, I have never seen so many people suddenly concerned about workers' rights and jobs. <laughs> I've never seen it. I've been standing on picket lines in this country for 10 years. I've been standing on picket lines in this country for 10 years and I'll tell you what, it's only a recent event we see a Labour politician near us. Never mind any of these people that are marching up and down in London talking about workers' rights. In 2008 when the credit crunch hit, it made no difference to people like me. People going, oh, we're going to lose jobs, everyone's skin. I thought, hang on, I'm skinned every day of my life. <laughs> credit crunch is just like another cereal the kids on my estate couldn't afford to eat. Every time I open my front door, it's a credit crunch. And suddenly we're meant to be worried about the collapse of neoliberalism, what's going on around us. Now, we've always opposed the European Union as a trade union, and the entire British Labour movement did on those grounds. Because we've always, think of the tradition that we stand in, in the Labour movement. You go right back to the Putney debates. The Chartists, the Suffragettes, Peter Lou, General Ned Ludd and his army of redressers, the bold defiance, the 84 miner strike, the 66 tightly knit group of politically motivated men. All of them had the same principles in their art, and that is the democratic ownership of our government and of our industries and of our lives. We are not, we are, and now people want us to sacrifice that entire movement on the altar of the EU. That somehow a bunch of technocrats that we don't elect somewhere else are going to be a defence against our own ruling class. It's nonsense. We've never been afraid of the Tories. We've beaten before and we'll do it again. And I tell you, the problem we've got in the left is, as the institutions of the working class and their jobs have been removed from around this country, some of their institutions have been taken over 
by the Liberals. And that is a problem for us. Because I can tell you what, whatever you think about people that turn out for Tommy Robinson demos or any other march like that, the one thing that unites them people beyond whatever other bigotry that's going on is their hatred of the Liberal left. And they are right to hate them. They are correct. Because they are the people who have seen their industries taken away, who have captured their Labour Party, and are now talking to them like they're the scum of the earth. There's too many in the Labour Party right now, they've made a calculation that there's a certain section of the, the top end of the working class in alliance with people they calculate from ethnic minorities and the Liberals. That's enough to get them into power. And they believe that that alliance is all they need, that they can disregard all of the working class people in this country that have been driven away from the Labour movement by the neoliberals over the years. I'll tell you what, they do so at their peril. Because if, the, if, if we don't have the left organising and, and representing the working class in this country, then it's a dangerous day when somebody else does. And I tell you what, if it comes to a scrap in this country and the working class ain't on our side, the left is in deep, deep trouble. So we have got to be aware of that. Now, I knew we would win the vote. A lot of people didn't think we would. I mean, there's people in this room that attest, I called it, I said we'd win it, but I never thought we'd get out of it. Because it's like the old tell call of California. You can, you can vote to leave, but you never can. <laughs> There has never been a democratic vote against any institution of the European Union that's been respected. The Dutch were turned over, the French were turned over, the Irish were turned over and then turned over again. Every time there's a vote, it's turned over in the interests of those that are in power. And I don't care what anyone says, you know, I don't think there is this, this great... Uh, the, 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 the difference between leave and remain is it's such a small thing that there's more things that unite us than there is the separators. I don't believe that at all. I think there's a class divide in this country. There is a class divide in this country, and I tell you what, there is a lot of people out there who don't vote, who if you give them something to vote for, will get out of bed and come to the ballot box. And I tell you what, you can't give people lacklustre, lukewarm promises. If you give people something decent, they will turn out. This was the first election I've ever voted in that I felt like it was going to mean something. I've held me nose and voted Labour all of them years, and couldn't see too much difference between them and the Tories, to be honest with you. And that's the truth. My trade union founded the Labour Party. We were kicked out of it. We just had an annual general meeting recently where our members, even though we're good friends with Corbyn, he's looked after us for years, did not trust going back into the Labour Party because of the likes of Tom Watson and all the rest of those fifth columnists in there who are trying to do us in. We have had enough of neoliberalism. What people want in this country is a decent house, they want a decent job, they want a health service, they want education for their kids, and they want a pension so they can retire in dignity. And every one of those things are in opposition to private ownership of the economy. So the only thing that matters in this country right now is who owns what. That is the question we have got to fight on. I'm sick of people coming from the left talking about all of these different types of issues. If we are not fighting on the fundamental basis of who owns our economy, then we are not engaged in left-wing activity as far as I can see it. And for the first time, we've got a Labour Party with a manifesto that I would gladly vote for. But I tell you what, it's worth so much bug paper inside the European Union. My industry, the railway, privatised under EU Directive 91-440, we cannot take it back into public ownership under the terms of the, the fourth European rail package. I am blue in the face from explaining to neoliberals on a, a, and pro-EU people you cannot nationalise railways under this legislature, even when you show them the text of it, even when you show them in black and white. I mean, the EU write this stuff down for you. They're not hiding it. It's not a secret. They show you. Even when you tell them and you show them, they still don't believe you. The European Union is an empire. Why is it all of a sudden we cannot see that? Just like the Berlin Conference that carved up Africa prior to World War I, we've got the Continental Agreement which shackles all the former Connollys to the imperialist powers in the European Union. Ireland has become a warehouse for the likes of Amazon to offshore their taxes through sales into the European Union. The une uneven economic development in the European Union means Ireland, a country that suffered colonialism and imperialism for most of its history, cannot industrialise. It is trapped forever as a warehouse for the likes of Amazon uh, and the others. They must have their budget rubber stamped by people they can't elect before it even goes to their parliament. Every Irish man, woman and child in the country is a debt slave to the tune of 44,000 euros to bail out French and German banks, some of them with turnovers 20 times the size of the Irish economy. For what died the sons of Roisin? 
When Peter stood on the steps of the GPI, was this what they fought for? Is this what our ancestors fought for? To take down one flag and put another flag up, just as Imperial was the last one? And here we are. And you get people now, all of a sudden, in this country, on the left, I have to say, with some honourable exceptions, they've somehow discovered there's a border in Ireland. <laughs> I mean, I wish they'd come across it a little bit earlier on. All of a sudden, the border in Ireland, everyone becomes an expert on it. I can tell you now, there is nothing in the Good Friday Agreement that prevents a Brexit. The only thing that prevents any arrangements in Ireland to satisfy any deal is political will. And you have to see what is really going on. And that is those people on the other side of the table in Europe do not want to make a deal with us. I don't know why people can't see it. Any trade unionist in this country can tell you, you cannot negotiate a tea break with the employer if they don't want to negotiate with you. It's as simple as that. That's how it works. All of this take no deal off of the table. Jesus Christ, if I went into my depot next week and said I'm negotiating the new rosters for the week, everyone, by the way, no deals off the table, they'd hang me. I couldn't get to the end of the platform <laughs> because it's nonsense and everyone knows it's nonsense. You cannot negotiate a deal with the other side if they don't want one. So we have got to leave the European Union, I believe, on WTO rules. It's the only way out. Let's get out of it. It's what we voted for. <laughs> now, people talk about... I've heard about a soft Brexit. I've heard about an hard Brexit. I've heard about a limp Brexit, a medium Brexit, a blue Brexit. I've never heard so many different types of Brexit. But it was quite helpful because the Prime Minister at the time wrote to all of us here with our own taxpayers' money, telling us we must stay in the European Union, by the way, and explained to us that that meant leaving the institutions of the European Union, the customs union, the single market, the lot. That's what we voted for. Now, we've got a parliament that does not want to leave the European Union. And it's like a charade. We've got all of these politicians, all of them pretending they want to leave the European Union, arguing with each other people who also don't want to leave the European Union. So what we do need is a general election to replace those politicians with people who will deliver on the democratic vote of the people. But I'm telling you now, I've heard a lot of stuff over this past few years, and everything the Remain side has said has been wrong. They told us that if we voted Brexit, we'd be living in a permanent Tory-UKIP alliance. We said it will split the Tory party. We said David Cameron and Osborne will be in the bin. We've done it. We've got a surge in left-wing leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. It's a time for optimism. Everything we've said has been right, and everything we've said has been wrong. So we've got to get out there, we've got to keep the fight going, because I tell you what, if you give people something worth getting out of bed for, they will. And that means we have got to take our industries back into public ownership. We have got to rebuild the industries that have been taken away from us. We've got to pe give people jobs and dignity and housing, and we cannot do that inside a neoliberal EU. Prayer would have been